It's Ben and Brooke Stoffel. They've been married 10 years. They have four young children. They're eight, six, four, and 18 months old. Ben has served in the ministry for nearly 15 years in his home church. He was a youth pastor and discipleship coordinator for half that time. And he spent the last seven and a half years as a lead or senior pastor. Brooke has taught elementary education for eight years, but for the last five years has transitioned to a stay-at-home mother and a homeschool teacher. Ben is currently in a third-year Ph.D. student earning a degree in organizational leadership from Regent University. Ben has traveled to several countries over the years, but is currently focused on equipping church leaders in Guatemala and Central America. Together, Ben and Brooke help pastors and leaders in Guatemala through teaching and coaching and leadership, life in Christ, and healthy marriages and family life. Encouragement, prioritizing becoming healthy churches. God has blessed and expanded the fruit of Ben and Brooke's influence in Guatemala. In the U.S., their current ministry focus is centered upon helping local churches through teaching and encouragement. They also specialize in leader care, leadership development, and healthy marriage equipping. So after we got to know Ben, we asked him to help give me a hand here, a little insight in church organizational structure and leadership and, and organizational, you know, the, the behind-the-scenes part of church. We, we, we realize God's put it on us that we need to do this better. And so the Manichees rose up, and they, they've been a great blessing to us, and they do so much. It's amazing. But um, So Ben is actually working with the Manichees and Liz and I on how to, how to do everything better at return. So this is, this is going to really bear fruit. We, we just got a real connection with this guy. I trust him. I don't trust easy. It takes years to earn my trust. But for some reason, God, every now and then you meet someone, God just connects you and tells you, you can trust this guy. So that, that's where I am with them. He's, he's going to be a blessing to us. And we're just going to turn the service over to him at this point. It's Ben Stoffel. Would you all give a big, big hand clap? What a warm welcome. It's such a privilege to be here. I, I am just really blessed to have met your pastors. What a mighty group of pastors that you are blessed with as a church. Amazing people of God. My wife, Brooke, and I were so attracted to their humility and their vulnerability. The Success that God has blessed them with in life, but the way that they carry themselves with that brokenness where they carry the cross of Jesus Christ around with them. It's so fragrant and so powerful. It's very attractive when you're walking with Christ. These are the type of people you want to be around. So, pastors, I want to thank you so much for welcoming me and my family. And the love and the care that you have shown us has been just extraordinary. We really, really appreciate that. Well, I'm excited to be here with you. Last time when I was here, I was sitting out among you, and I leaned over to my wife, and I said, now this would be a fun church to preach in. <laughs> you guys are so alive and so full of life. I love it. Yeah. I tell you what, after a while, playing church gets old and boring, and you just crave the presence of God. You just want the presence of God. If we don't have the presence of God, then what are we doing? Let's go home and go golfing or go swimming or something. But when I, all the times I've been here, well, both the times I've been here, just the presence of God has been so rich. Man, I tell you what, just the worship in God. And I hope to carry that through in our teaching today and then have a little bit of time at the end for for just a response. As we consider this topic The reverent awe. Reverent awe. As you see this picture behind me, this is a photo I grabbed from NASA.gov. This is a picture of deep space. Included in this picture are things that we can barely fathom. How many of you, when you were young, created a solar system model for science class or something? You remember that? Sometimes some foam balls and some wire. You put up maybe eight or nine planets. Pluto got um, downgraded to a dwarf planet. But when I made the model, it was a planet. So you put maybe eight 
or nine planets up there and you take it in and you're like, wow, we're, you know, this is amazing. We're not the only planet. There's other planets in our solar system. Well, I want to take a moment and just examine the greatness of our God. You see, we know that scripture tells us that God is beyond what we can think or imagine. We know that scripture tells us that his, his thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. But unless we stop and examine the greatness of God, life is so busy. Issues of life are so cumbersome that we can move through whole periods of time without stopping to look up and consider the greatness of our God. Something powerful happens when we stop and consider the greatness of God. God creates an experience of awe inside of us. When we stop and we actually just fathom the greatness, the great unsearchability of our God, something happens in the heart and the mind of the human soul and in our spirit. Our spirit just melts before this incredible creator. God, it's his greatness. My goal this morning with you is to exalt the greatness of God. Because as we do that, he creates a sense of awe inside our spirit. So we're going to look at some passages together. But before we get there, I want to just observe creation. In creation, God puts so many marks of greatness all through his creation. The things we drive by every day. We live under this incredible canopy of stars and galaxies. Recently, scientists in 2012, NASA released findings that indicated that our Milky Way galaxy could contain up to 100 billion planets. Now, who wants to make that science project? (laughs) It's a lot of foam balls. 100 billion planets just in our Milky Way galaxy. As science continues to advance, we're able to see more deeper into space. We're able to actually capture these images that are just beyond explanation. Scientists believe that, according to their calculations from what they can see through the Hubble telescope, that there may be up to 200 billion galaxies similar to the Milky Way. You know why God told Abraham to step outside of his tent? Because he started thinking too small. He was living his life, handling the problems of life over and over again. Life became routine. God said, hey, Abraham, come out here. Let me show you. Let me show you something. You see all these stars? And those were just visible with the naked eye. No telescopes. He said, I'm going to... This is my greatness. Look up. Look at my creation. Recently in 2017, scientists from the University of Nottingham concluded that there are perhaps 10 times more galaxies than we originally thought. 10 times more than 200 billion. 2 trillion. As if 200 billion galaxies wasn't enough to impress us. They're saying there's probably 10 times more than that. And you know what? As science continues to advance, as we're able to see better, all we're going to see is more vastness and more greatness of God. Amen? Amen. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, the author writes, Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. I want to hang out on that phrase, reverence and awe. If you're reading in the New King James or King James or some other translations, sometimes when it says awe, in the ESV, it'll say fear or godly fear in the New King James. And I want to talk about those two words for a minute. There's two types of fear. There's a dreadful fear that has a negative sense that God reserves for his enemies. How many of you at once lived as enemies of God? So how many of you were all familiar with that dreadful sense of fear? But thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have now experienced the washing and the cleansing of our sins. So now that dreadful fear that is reserved for the enemies of God We no longer have to experience because his perfect love has cast out that negative dreadful fear. And now we can experience a type of joyful fear. 
a type of joyful trembling, a joyful awe. When, when God overwhelms our senses, when his greatness is beyond our human ability to understand or comprehend, he, it, he kind of explodes on us with his presence and it leaves us in a sense of positive fear or awe, godly fear or awe. How many of you have had an experience with God that you would say, yeah, I can... I know exactly what you're talking about. It just melts you. You, you become almost just weak, just overwhelmed. Your, your body is just overwhelmed at the presence of God. Now, Hebrews says, the author of Hebrews says that there's an attitude of acceptable worship to God where we're actually before God in this state of reverence and awe, this godly fear, this positive sense of joyful exuberant and totally full of his presence beyond what we can handle it's an awe of god and it's a it's a command it's not a suggestion it's a command but i want to pause here for a second and just think you know is this telling us how to worship or is this inviting us to understand that if we are in awe of god if we're examining his greatness then we will, by nature, worship Him in an acceptable way. I don't think there's one person alive that can experience the measure of God's presence that melts them where they don't just spontaneously turn into worship. It's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. You're not going to be able to stop Him. Sometimes we come to church and we really need to be in the presence of God. We've had a hard week and we're working through some things and we just need a fresh touch of God. How many of you came in here like that this morning? Amen. Appreciate you being vulnerable enough to, to raise your hand. I believe that God has even more for us this morning because He glories in His children receiving a fresh touch from Him. He wants nothing more than to come and just refresh our spirits. To come and fill us with awe at the greatness of who He is. To come and to look upon our problems and the troubles of our life and say, Okay, now step outside your tent. Look up. Can you see the trillions of galaxies that I created? Mind you, out of nothing. By speaking. Creation, I just spoke it and all of these things came to be. Now let's talk about your problems. There's something that happens in our heart when we consider the greatness of God. The focus on this world shrinks and the focus on eternity opens up. And we begin to set our mind on things that are above where Christ is seated. And he's reigning. We also, I'm seated there. In Christ. Amen? God created us to be awed and captivated by His glory. In Psalm 22, verse 23. This is an incredible psalm. It's a messianic psalm. Jesus quotes from this psalm while He's on the cross near the end of His uh, life before He gives His life up. This is an incredible, powerful psalm. We don't have time to unpack it all today. But here in the midst of this beautiful psalm about pain and suffering, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is in the middle of this, is this other command. It sounds very similar to Hebrews. It says, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. It wasn't for an elect few to be awed in the presence of God. Friends, and it's the same today. Every believer who is filled with the the Holy Spirit, who's been born again, who's been baptized in water, we have this incredible opportunity to experience the greatness of God through awe, to get out of our normal life and, and to really experience the presence of God that may cause us to have a joyful trembling, that may cause us to experience a overwhelming sense of His presence on our human emotion. And God says, that's just a little taste of heaven. When you get up here, I'm going to give you a new glorified body so you can handle the full thing. <laughs> So we're going to take a moment and look at three types of people in Scripture who experienced in the, in the New Testament the awe of God's presence. And first group we're going to look at 
is unbelievers. And this is in Matthew chapter 7, 27, excuse me, verse 54. Now the context here is that Jesus is on the cross and he's giving up his life and he's just given his life for us. And you know that there were some signs that followed that. And there was an earthquake. In verse 51, you would see there's a powerful earthquake. Several things happened from that. The thick, heavy curtain in the, in the temple tore. It says that rocks were split open. It says that tombs opened up. You know what else it says? That saints who had passed came back to life and went and showed themselves to many people. That's the context of this passage. Is that something that may awe somebody? Amen? Okay. <laughs> But notice the people that scripture captures and tells us were odd. It's actually the, um, when the centurion and those who were with him, these are the people that crucified Jesus. These are the people that didn't believe in him, that mocked him, that literally put him to death. In verse 20, 54, it says, When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, or they were fi- filled with godly fear. Now, for them, there may have been a mixture of the type of fear they experienced. It may have been a bit of that, I need to get right with God fear, and a bit of that just overwhelming sense. I mean, this is the Son of God. Notice the power of the awe of God. Notice the power. Moments ago, these people literally just put him to death. And in one experience of the awe of God... Truth pierces their heart, cuts through confusion, cuts through years of wrong teaching of godly, worshiping earthly gods, cuts through right to the core of their spirit and says, truly, this is the Son of God. Wow! The power of the presence of God will cut through lies, bad teaching, False doctrines will cut through years and years of running away from the presence of God. Just one moment. Just one moment in the presence of God will bring clarity and truth right to the core of who a person is. They were so shaken. They were so awed by the presence of God that they couldn't help but admit with their own tongue. How many of you know every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is Lord. And here it happened right here. What we call a foretaste of things to come. It's a foretaste because people rose from the dead. Now it wasn't the true resurrection. Jesus did that, right? These people would have later gone on to uh, die again. But Jesus rose again with the resurrected body. And we see these enemies of God proclaiming this is truly the Son of God. I have no idea if a change happened in their heart or not. If it was a statement of personal faith or just a statement of fact being overwhelmed by the presence of God. Either way it happened. So unbelievers can be pierced with the presence of God. And when there is the power of God through awe, he shows up in powerful ways. Think about now Paul's words as he says, my preaching is not just with wise and persuasive arguments, but with what? Demonstration. The Spirit's power. Why? Because when, that, when the power would happen, awe would be created in the hearts of the people. And the message that had been spoken would pierce their heart. And they would respond like these centurions. The message Paul is saying is true. We need the power and the awe of God to accompany our teachings and our preachings and our evangelism. God bless you guys as you do this outreach through VBS. God bless you and multiply your fruit and pray that the presence of God and the awe of God will touch these children and their parents and their families and change their home. Just one touch. It could just be one teaching, one day of the VBS, just one time where the presence of God comes and they're experiencing the greatness of God in these little frames and these little bodies. And God's saying, I've marked you, I've marked you, I've marked you. You're mine, you're mine, you're mine. The next group of people that I want to talk about were some of Jesus' notorious hecklers. The scribes and Pharisees. In Luke chapter 5 verse 26. 
we hear another example of the result of God's greatness causing awe in the people that are with him. This time it's a different group of people. It's not unbelievers in the sense of centurions who haven't been trained religiously. It, are, it is people that have been overtrained religiously, who have studied the book but missed the one to whom it pointed. Amen. Now these Pharisees and scribes and teachers were arguing with Jesus because some friends had torn open the roof and, and brought in a man who was paralyzed because the spirit was in the room to heal. And they wanted their friend to get healed. Jesus saw their faith and he said, your sins are forgiven you. Now the scribes and Pharisees, when they heard Jesus say your sins are forgiven, that caused a huge problem because that would mean Jesus is equating himself with God. Only God has the power to forgive sins. And Jesus is like, exactly. He knew, their, he knew their thoughts and he's like, you know what, you're right. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. But as an object lesson, let me show you something. Take up your bed and walk. And he heals this paralytic right in front of all the people, okay? Everybody knew this guy. I mean, we didn't have cars and planes and things. People walked. So we kind of stayed in a certain location. Everyone knew this man. He had been paralyzed. Everybody knew how long he had been paralyzed, what his story was. And when Jesus spoke those words to him, in an instant he got up. Do you think that was an experience of awe? Yes, it was. And listen to what scripture says in Luke. Luke records it in chapter 5, verse 26. He said, an amazement seized them all. How many? All. Now remember that there's a group of scribes and Pharisees here. Teachers of the law and Pharisees. They're included in this all. Or else Luke would have left them out. He would have said, an amazement seized most of them, except the scribes and Pharisees. But he says, amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. I bet if we were there, we would have said the same thing. Or something even more extravagant. But these are the very people that a moment ago... We just saw the centurions a moment ago had crucified Jesus. These people were crucifying Jesus with their words. They were coming against everything that he said. They were causing problems all the time when he was doing ministry. But in one moment of awe, they experienced something new. They experienced something. They had never experienced this kind of stuff before. Imagine studying the scripture so well you could quote every single verse, but never having experienced the tangible presence of God. And in one moment, God broke through all of that religion and said, I am that I am that I am. And all they could do was be overwhelmed at the sense of awe, at the sense of greatness of God that had filled that place. Everyone seized with amazement. We have seen extraordinary things today. You want to keep going? All right. The third group of, I told you it was a fun place to preach. (laughs) I'm a little bit nervous because Pastor Bill, uh, when I was here, man, I was so blessed by his teaching and he's just such a gifted uh, man of God and just really blessed to to hear him and I understand that Pastor Elizabeth had uh, spoke with you last week and I know you guys are filled up and and are well fed and I'm just trying to bless you amen (laughs) the third group of people are the disciples themselves now this is going to hit a little bit closer to home because we're disciples in the house of the Lord this morning amen now Acts chapter 2 the context here A group of about 120 have been in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. It's an amazing delivery of the Holy Spirit has come. Tongues of fire, power is breaking out. Peter talks and evangelizes. 3,000 come to Christ in one day. The church is experiencing exponential growth. The church is just growing. It's, It's amazing. It's fun. It's new. And Acts 2 kind of records that they would get together, they would pray, they would fellowship, they would listen to the apostles' teachings. And then in 2.43, it says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now awe, or that godly fear, came upon every soul. 
These people were brought to Christ as much by the teaching as they were by the power that was moving through the region and impacting lives. Signs and wonders were done through the apostles. And there was a time in, in my life, having grown up in the church, where I kind of got tired of church as usual. We all do at some point. And we just, God was just stirring my heart for a cry, for something more. I said, God, I'm reading about all these things in the Bible, all this power, all this anointing, all of this incredible signs and wonders. I said, but God, I want to see them in my life. And God, it was God just creating a hunger. You know how he does that? He just works on you. It's not even you. It's him. He's, he's like, hey, I want to show you something. So I'm going to create this hunger in you so that you want to see it. And then I'm going to show it to you. And then we're going to go deeper in this relationship. It was kind of one of those times. It was maybe when I was 19 or 20. It was my first mission trip. Leading up to that mission trip, I was so moved with hunger for God. God was just working on me that I had committed a couple of days a week to fasting. I had never fasted like that in my life or since, but it was just a season where God was growing me. And that's how He had me to respond. So in those times of fasting, I'm preparing, I'm, I'm expecting, I'm saying, God, I want to see you do something. This is the first mission trip I've ever been on. I want to see you do something amazing. I'm thinking we're going to see people wander to Christ. We're going to see some healing, some miracles. But I was on a construction trip, so you got to kind of watch what trip you sign up for. <laughs> so on the construction trip, I get there, and we're building this church out in a village, a remote village out in the hillside of, of Guatemala. Just no good way to get there. It's in the middle of nowhere. And the only other churches are staunch religious churches or Catholic churches that are mixed with Mayan religion. So they have idolatry and then also Catholicism in the same building and so they've just taken over by assimilation so there's no real evangelical presence in this village and there was a witch doctor that lived up the other hill before we had come down there we didn't find out about this till later but God had sent a storm a heavy storm through and it had caused so much rain and torrential downpour that the home of the witch doctor was washed down the side of the mountain and totally destroyed and I understand that he then left that area. Well, that opened the way for this church and for the gospel to come. And here I am, we're, we're, we're building. We're building with, with block and wood. Now, you have such a beautiful auditorium, and you see these beams, these trusses. I don't know what you call them. All the builders in here, help me. But uh, one of these big trust support beams just like this except it's not one piece in Guatemala it's like maybe 20 pieces of wood all put together to make a v-shape out of pieces that weren't made to be v-shapes okay so that's just how it went up well while we're building this church the the block walls were up and we were ready to set the trusses to put on the tin roof of of this church and while one of the indigenous Guatemalan workers was up on this truss Something incredible happened. One of the spots in the beam started to creak. Then there was a loud... <laughs> all the tools and equipment that was running, no matter how much noise there was, there was this loud crack. It seemed to echo off the mountains and everybody stopped. All the machinery shut down. And the sense of dread kind of came over us all in one second. The enemy was at work. This guy had lodged himself with his legs wrapped around the beam. And when the beam broke, it pivoted and came straight down onto a dirt floor, except for one foot of cement that connected the two walls, which is where his head landed, while his legs were still mangled onto the beam. We began to pray in the spirit. Didn't have words. A pool of blood slowly forming from the side of his head that we can't see. Now, up until this time, I'm a little disappointed. I said, God, where are you on this trip? We came to impact people and we're building a structure. I didn't understand the plans of God. 
Being yet a late teenager, there was much to learn. I still have much to learn. And only moments before, we were all inside this small little tin hut while it rained and rained and rained. And we were praying that God would stop the rain so we could finish the church. And in that little place, God showed me a vision. He showed me the sky opening up and the sun shining down on the church, but nowhere else. And in this vision, I'm praying and I'm like, I'm not going to share this with these guys. I peek my head out. The clouds are so thick and dark. You know, who wants to be the guy to say, hey, guys, I know it's raining right now, but God's going to open up the sky and the sun's going to come down and shine on our building and we're going to be able to finish. So I didn't share it. But the rain subsides, the clouds are still there. And it's maybe 30 to 60 minutes later that this event happens. Okay. So there we are. We're all now gathering around this Guatemalan man who we found out wasn't even a Christian. He had just come to help build the church. This pool of blood and his legs tangled in a way that looks like if he's alive, he's definitely going to be paralyzed. You know, his back is probably broken in multiple places. It's kind of a gruesome scene. I won't paint more details than that. But we're just praying for him, praying for him. And all of a sudden, as we're praying, just in the spirit, we see his eyes flicker. Like how sometimes if a light's been off for a while and you turn it back on and it flickers and then it comes on. His eyes were flickering. We kept praying, flickering. Then they opened. I don't know if that I've ever seen a person that was dead or in a coma. I don't know. I don't need to know. But we weren't checking all that out. We were praying. The important thing is God brought him back from whatever, wherever he was. Because he had a plan for his life. So a couple of our, our guys untangle his legs and put an arm over each shoulder and just kind of carry him out with his legs off the ground, you know, off to the, to the truck so that we can drive hours through the mountains, which these are not paved roads. There's more potholes than there are road. And, and you're driving these, these incredibly arduous trails to get to the hospital a few hours away. On the way to the hospital... One of the brothers that was with us led this man to Christ. Amen. Incredible. Incredible. While they're taking him to the hospital, we continue praying. As we're praying, the sky above our church opens. The sun is bright as day. Shines down on our church. You could walk up the mountain a bit, you'd be in the rain. You could walk down the mountain a bit, you'd be in the rain. You could walk to either side, you'd be in the rain. But over our church, it was bright. The sun shone on that place. This man comes back from the hospital. No broken bones. No problems of any kind. And he's pastoring that church today. And that church is full of members. Praise God. That's one of my awe experiences with God. It still moves me to remember that story and to share it. Thank you for letting me share it with you. When we experience the awe of God, we're moved in a way that leaves an indelible mark. We're going to remember it forever. And anytime we're going through our next challenge, God reminds us of the last time we saw His greatness. If you ever read in the Psalms or in uh, different parts of the Old Testament, how many times is just recounting the works that God has already done? So we don't forget His greatness. So we don't forget to look up and see the power of our Creator who's looking over our lives and guiding every step. Now, friends, I know like me, I can tell you're a church that doesn't play church. You're a church that wants more of God. Amen. I see that in your leadership and I sense that in your meeting times. And I believe that God is going to meet that desire for you because I believe he created that desire in you. God works in us to create a desire for more of him simply because he wants to show us more of him. The encouraging thing is it's not you. You can't create that desire yourself. We, we are but flesh. We need the power of the living God to breathe life into us. But when he does... Friends, hang on because there is greatness in store 
for the stirring. After the stirring, always is greatness. The greatness of God. I want to pause here for a second in Acts chapter 2, 43. The whole church is experiencing awe at the greatness of God. But those creating the awe are the apostles. Do you see this? As I underline, through the apostles. God is looking for vessels who have been so awed in their personal time that they're ready to share that awe for others to experience it too. If we reflect just for a moment on the journey that the apostles have had, these are the people that knew Jesus the best. They had spent the most personal time with him. They had seen the most miracles. They had been sent out personally by Jesus on the most missions. These are people who had seen Jesus heal, feed, deliver, set free, over and over and over again. But more than that, these are people that sat with him, that ate with him, that cried with him, that prayed with him. Can you imagine the intimacy of their connection with the Lord Jesus Christ? Later, as they're filled with power, they're out doing signs and wonders. But I wonder how much of the power of their ministry came from their personal relationship with Jesus. We have to have the power of the Spirit. But all of the people in the upper room had the same power. They all experienced this power. What was different about the apostles? The apostles were the people alive on earth at that time that had the most personal experience with Jesus. They're the closest to Him. Now I pull out a principle from that. I love to find principles whenever we can in Scripture. We must experience awe in our personal relationship with God and then He will use us to inspire awe in others. If we're not awed by the greatness of God... What are we sharing? What do we got? A message? Wise and persuasive words? Paul says, hey, I bet Paul could make a great argument. He's a pretty forceful personality. But he said, I'm not, you know what I'm relying on? I'm relying on power. Paul, next, next to the other disciples, had a personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's... He's seen such a powerful image that it blinded him for three days. You talk about an experience of awe. Saul had it. So powerful it changed his name. Blinded him. Incredible power of God that came upon Paul. He says, what was that? Let me share that with others. I already know everything this says. I can recite this from memory, but let me share that type of experience I just had. Who wants a type of experience like that? Give it to me now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. With Paul, it's going to line up with the word because he had the word memorized. You see, today people are too driven to experience. They try to ignore the word to get experience. That's not how it goes. All the people that we're reading about today had studied the word, had known the word, had hidden the word in their heart, and God just came with power to give them ministry, to enable them to create awe in other people that were seeking God, and people that were frustrated with God, and people that needed encouragement from God. He said, here is power, now go out. Go heal the sick. Go bind up the brokenhearted. Everything that Jesus declared in Isaiah became the ministry of the apostles. Those that walked with Jesus inherited his ministry and his command. He said, I'm leaving you, but I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm going to send my spirit. My spirit's going to come and live in you and remind you of everything I've taught you. And you're going to go out and you're going to be game changers. You're going to be world changers. You're going to experience awe and you're going to let others experience awe through you. Well, I think this church is at a point where you guys are, are looking for God to help you be awe creators of the presence of God. I experienced that in your worship time, from the worship team members to the people that are praying to your pastoral leadership. I'm experiencing the presence of God as I interact with you. Do you know how rare that is or how powerful that is? Do you know how important that is? You know how many churches we have and you know how many teachings we have and how many people are saying we're right? 
Well, we're one of them, aren't we? But what about this? What about when the stakes are high and there's an opportunity for God to show off? Then who's going to be right? Who's going to be right? When the power shows up, who's right? When the presence of God starts to create an awe experience in the people that are arguing with us or fighting with us about the scripture, what are they going to say? You know what's going to come out of their mouth? They may still be an unbeliever. You know what they're going to say? Truly, you're right. This is the Son of God. They may not even want to say it. It's going to come out of their mouth. Because who can resist the incredible power and greatness of God? Man loves to puff themselves up with all of their pride, all of their success, everything that the world has to offer. They love to be right. One experience with the presence of God. The proudest man on the earth will melt. And out of his mouth will say, Jesus, you are the true. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Friends, all we're going to do is win. We've got a lifetime of winning ahead of us. And then we've got an eternity of a celebration among the winners. Amen. That's it. That's what we have in store. It may not feel like that right now. But friends, step outside of our tent and look up. It may not feel like that right now, but friends, let's step outside of our problems and our circumstances and let's say, God, I don't know that I feel your greatness, but I'm going to observe it. And as you observe it, as you really take in the greatness of God, I guarantee you it will create an atmosphere of worship in your heart and out of your mouth over a period of time will come adoration and praise to the only living God. You won't be able to contain it. I love this story in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me set the context here. This is Elijah. Elijah has just experienced an incredible awe miracle. He's put a bull on an altar. And 450 prophets of the worshipers of Baal have put a bull on the altar. And they're having a contest. They say Baal's the true God. Elijah says God is the true God. And Elijah says, okay, enough with the arguing. Let's have an awe experience. You pray that, that Baal will come and accept your sacrifice and burn it up. And that will be the sign that he's received it. And I'll pray that my God will come and do that. Now you know the story. But what I love about Elijah is he, he toys with it a bit. If you read in 18 and 19, he's like, how's it going over there? I'm paraphrasing. How's it going over there? You guys got anything yet? And it says after that, that they begin to cut themselves. Attract Baal through blood. So their own blood is flowing. It says their own blood is flowing abundantly. No response. Elijah then says, why don't you come and pour some water on, on my offering? Water and fire don't mix. He's trying to up the ante a bit. Then he says, do it again. Then he says, do it again. And he built like a trough around the altar so that the water would sit there and just sit there. It's totally drenched. The offering's wet. There's no way it's going to burn by human expectation. And there's extra water just sitting there. Lo and behold... Elijah prays, down comes the fire of God. It says it consumes the offering and all of the water that was even around it. The people are amazed. Elijah has the 450 prophets of Baal executed. Jezebel hears about this and vows to take Elijah's life. So Elijah runs. He runs into the tower of the righteous. How many of you have ever had to run to the tower of the righteous? Amen. Where God, it's God. He's running to God. He's running specifically to Mount Sinai, to the Mount of God, where Moses would have experienced God. But I don't know if he knows exactly where he's going. He's running for his life. And he sits down under a broom tree, the Bible says, and there he despairs of life. He's having a manic depressive, what we would call a manic depressive episode. He's asking God to take his life. He said, God, I'm done. 
I, just, I share this with you because one, it's scripture. Two, I think it paints this picture with so much more richness and detail. He's ready to be done. He's despairing of life. Things are so bad in Israel. Not, not just with Jezebel chasing him, but people have left God. It's an apostate nation. They're worshiping other gods. Even this, they're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping all kinds of false gods. And Elijah said, it's, I'm, I'm done. I can't, I, can't hand, I can't do ministry in this environment, in this culture. It's just too broken. It's too harsh. It's too cold. And they're out to kill me. And I think a kind of fear or dread had come over him. And in that weakened state, he just said, God, just take me. And we know that an angel of the Lord came and woke him up because he had lost his appetite. He didn't want to eat. And God gave him strength to eat, strength to eat. And then God sustained him on 40 days and 40 nights of a journey from where he was to Mount Sinai. He gets there. And God speaks to him and asks him why he's here. And he tells God why he's here. And God said that in, in 1 Kings 19 11, just so you know the context, this guy is worn out, he's burnt out, he's done with ministry, he's ready for God to just take him. How many of you have been at a low point in your life? If you live long enough, you're just, we're going to come to these points where it's just, it's just low. It's dark. And, and God's greatness Wherever it is, it's not impacting us the way it used to. Here's a man that just moments ago called fire down from heaven to consume an offering that was soaking wet. It's not like he was short of miracles. It's not like, oh, I've never seen God. I'm just tired of going to church. This is not Elijah. He had seen really incredible, just powerful moves of God. He had seen people be awed over and over and over again. But even he needed to have a fresh word spoken from God. And this is an application point that... Does that mean? All right. Thank you. This is an application point that we'll leave with today. A principle that comes out of his story. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. And God said, go, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains, broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, verse 12, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Now, if you're reading in the New King James, it's going to say a still, small voice, right? How many of you have heard that phrase before? The still small voice. That's what we're used to. This is the ESV. It says, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the cave, entrance of the cave. I want to hang out here for a minute. What kind of jumped out at me as I read this is that here's this man that's exhausted. He's seen so much of God. Here's God appearing in these demonstrative expressions. You know, first we see this great wind that's so powerful, it's like breaking the rocks. Have you been around or, or heard or seen a documentary of a tornado or a hurricane? I mean, it's so deafening loud. The wind is just so loud. The decibels are so high. Here comes this great wind that's breaking apart rocks and throwing things down around him. And he's just standing there in the presence of God. But it says God wasn't in the wind. And then an earthquake comes, and if you've ever felt a little tremor or a big tremor, you know that your body is shaking. You're standing on ground that's moving. I don't know how violently, but he's being moved physically. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And then a fire comes through, maybe before him or up higher than him. Somehow he's seen this fire come, pass by. God's not in the fire. And then I, I want you to just think for a moment. We've just seen a great wind like a tornado, an earthquake, a fire. These are huge natural disasters, right? How loud, how noisy, how violent everything must have been around him. Now friends, I'm, I'm inviting us to consider this because sometimes our life feels like this. 
Sometimes it feels like life is just so busy. Everything's just turning around. It's like I can't get a handle on what's going on today or this week or in this life or whatever. And sometimes it feels like we're kind of on shaky ground. We're not sure what's going to happen. We don't know what God's doing. We don't know where the money's going to come from. We don't know exactly what is going on in our marriage or in our family life. And we're trusting God to bring an end to the, to the shaking. And sometimes we're experiencing things like fires, like destruction. Things are being taken from us. Or we're experiencing loss of different kinds. Life can be tumultuous. And here it's happening live in front of Elijah. And then in a moment, everything just stops. And when, when you've had like really, 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 really loud things happening for a while... Have you ever experienced that? And then it just stops. Like the power cuts off. You're running a saw or sweeper or something really loud. Then the power just cuts and there's no other noises. You just go from this really high, intense, almost unbearable on your ears to a low whisper. How did Elijah perceive this? How did Elijah perceive this? I mean, he had just been in the midst of turmoil. And yet there's a sound of a low whisper. I'm going to hang out on this for a moment. I looked at several different translations. And how they interpreted this idea of the noise that Elijah would have heard. The ESV says low whisper. New American Standard says there was a gentle blowing. King James and New King James says a still, small voice. NIV says a gentle whisper. Holman Christian Standard, a soft whisper. New Revised Standard, sheer silence. I'm hanging out on this for a moment because I want us to see a man who is accustomed to awe. He was accustomed to to just being overwhelmed by the presence of God and God moving through him to create awe experiences in others, yet he was tuned to the faintest whisper of the voice of God. Friends, you can only get there by time alone with God. And Elijah had his time alone. We can only get to the point where we're hearing a low whisper in the midst of the turmoil Because of our relationship with God. Just like the apostles. The only way that they were able to create awe experiences for others. Was because of their personal time with their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. While he walked the earth. I dug a little bit into the original language. In 1 Kings 19 verse 12. And on this idea of the sound of a low whisper. And I broke it down into word sections. The sound literally means, in the original text, an auditory effect produced by a given cause. That makes sense. How would you describe a sound? It's a sound. It came from a cause. We don't gain much by, by seeing that sentence. The sound of a low. The word low there can mean thin, small, soft, gentle, quiet, or soothing. That's why in your different translations they pull different words in. Because it can mean all of these and the interpreters have to take the word in context and then say, what's the best use of this word in the context? So in the New King James, they said, well, it's like something that's low, it's still and small. It's small. ESV said it's low. Others said soothing. Some said gentle. Some said soft. It's all the same word. It just creates kind of different ideas in our mind. I love words, and so I get caught up in this, so just bear with me if words aren't, aren't uh, as exciting to you as they are to me. But the next one, whisper. It can mean quiet calm, or calmness, as in the sense of without wind and waves. And there's only three times in all of Scripture that this word is used. Here in 1 Kings, in Psalm 107, and in Job. And in the other two times, it means still or silent. What what Elijah heard was what he didn't hear. Are you with me? What he heard was what he didn't hear. 
He didn't hear the noise of the chaos that had just happened in front of him. There was no loud ringing and banging in his head from all of that. He was attuned. He knew God was speaking. God told him to go stand out there. He knew God was going to speak. The, the noise of the wind. Okay, God, you're not in that. The earthquake. He's listening. He's looking. Okay, God, you're not in that. The fire. He's looking. He's listening. God, you're not in that. He's intentional. He's listening. He's not afraid for his life. In fact, it says that the only time he covered his face was when he actually heard the whisper. When he heard that low, thin silence. When he heard that absence of chaos. How powerful it would be if we could get to a place of quiet. Of absence of chaos. Where we could stop and just consider the greatness of God. What we would hear in that absence of chaos could be described as a still small voice or a low whisper or a gentle calm. It's the ability to not be caught up in all that is spinning around us and to quiet our heart before God. The principle I pulled out of that is that to hear the stillness, we must be still. To hear the stillness of God We must ourselves be still. This idea takes us to our next passage over in Psalm chapter 46 verse 10. You guys still with me this morning? Appreciate you. Let's read this together out loud. Psalms 46 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted among in the earth. I told you that my goal this morning was to lift up the greatness of God so that we might grow in our experience of awe before Him. I believe that this passage from the psalmist is meant to do that very same thing. In, in this text, it may be one verse, but as we pick it apart, we can see that to be still actually means to stop. It means you're in motion. It means you're busy. It means you're in a state of activity. And to be still means stop. All the things that you're doing, all of the chaos, all of the activity, all of the demands, all of the schedules, all of the payments, everything, just stop. Be still. Be still. When you study that passage in 1 Kings, you'll see that somehow Elijah learned how to be still in the midst of some pretty incredible chaos. One of our greatest disciplines as Christians is to learn in this fast-paced, busy culture how to be still, how to stop, how to put an end to a state of activity. And know. To know means to make yourself aware of, to call to mind the facts of a specific piece of information. The psalmist says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop what you're doing. And I want you to go and consider the greatness of God. Stop what you're doing. Go and consider the greatness of God. That this would be a practice in our lives. How do we become those people that actually move? God moves all through us. We have to be experiencing awe in our own relationship with God. And it only happens when we be still and know that He is God. Oh, that's so boring. I've heard that a million times. I've got to have my personal time with God. Friends, if you're hearing me this morning, God has to awe you in your personal time with Him. God has to have an encounter with you in your personal time with Him. You have to walk away and know that the stillness that you just had with God, you were able to hear His stillness speak to you. It's so incredible, this power that we have to be transformed from glory to glory by experiencing the presence of God. I pull from Ecclesiastes 5. Now, Pastor Bill said you usually go to 2, 2 2.30. Is that... No, he didn't say that. Praise (laughs) God. I'm going to pull from Ecclesiastes right here. I love this passage. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Draw near to listen. 
To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know they are doing evil. Essentially what this is saying is, as somebody comes to the house of God, and they're coming in the chaos. They're coming with the earthquake and the tornado and the fire. And they're coming with it all spinning around in their head. And they've got a million things they want to tell God. Got a... God, can you handle this? God, can you handle this? God, I've got this. God, I'm worried about this. God, would you take care of this relationship? God, pay for this bill. God, help me understand what decision to make over here. God, I've got a, so many things on my mind. Ecclesiastes says, now, now wait a minute. Guard your steps. You're coming to the house of God. You're coming to a place where we're going to examine the greatness of God together. So let's just think about Guard. Think about how you're coming before God. And let's draw near to listen. Let's, let's hear something from Him. Let's be still and know that He is God. Let's hear from Him. And as we hear from Him, I guarantee you what's going to happen is it's going to create a sense of awe in you that begins to dwarf your problems because it dwarfs your own experience in life on this earth. And you say, God, I can't wait to be with you. Lord, I give you my life. Lord, you're in charge of it all. Do what you want with all these problems. I'm yours no matter what. Here we go. Now there's a power of the Holy Spirit when that awe comes upon us. I'm not saying you're going to have to think that. You just will. Because the greatness of God will come on you in such a powerful way. You won't have any other response but to say, God, thank you. I am yours. Last thing on your mind will be the problems that we walked up into the house of God with. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And here's a principle that I drew from that. Connected. To these all experiences. When our words are few, God's words are many. When our words are few, God's words are many. I'm confident that the Holy Spirit is speaking truth to us constantly. But until we come away in those still places, until we learn how to be still in noisy places, we have to come away to quiet places. Are you with me? If you, if you become really good and adept and well practiced at coming away in quiet places and hearing God, you'll start to be better at hearing Him in noisy places. And like Elijah, you'll be able to be in considerable noise and still hear that still small voice. It happens through practice. It's our only way. And as you hear that still small voice, the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you about how to create awe experiences for other people around you. And you'll share out of the awe that you have been touched by. Now I close with this passage. John chapter 16. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. I've asked them just to sing one song with us as we close this morning. That song is called How Great Is Our God. It's fitting because we're exploring His greatness this morning. John chapter 16. Verses 13 to 15. says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. Now you've seen this passage. How many of you have seen this passage before? This is a great passage. The Gospel of John. Incredible. Then He goes on to say, verse 14 and 15, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify Me. For He will take what is mine and declare it to you, that's us, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that He, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is Jesus is mine and declare it to you. Friends, what John is describing is that there is an action of the Holy Spirit as He lives inside of us where the Holy Spirit is actually declaring to you the greatness of our God. All the time. The Holy Spirit is inside of each one of you. If you're born again Christian this morning, the Holy Spirit is inside of you and He's declaring to you the greatness of our God. Listen, He's taking everything that belongs to the Father through Christ and the Holy Spirit in you. He resides in us. He's declaring it to us. He's declaring it to us. But sometimes the declaring sounds like that low whisper. That still small voice. We say, well, I'm not hearing God. Let's be still. Let's be quiet. In order to hear the stillness of God, we have to be still before Him. As we're still before Him, I guarantee you, you're going to hear the Holy Spirit speak. Just like Elijah did. Just like the apostles did. He's going to say things to us that wow us. He's going to say things to us that cause us to step outside of our proverbial tent 
that cause us to look up at the greatness of God and say, I am that I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I've got you. I've seen your days from the end to the beginning. Before I formed you, I knew you in the womb. All of your days were ordained before one of them came to be. I've got this. Now let's leave it and come away with me. That's the power of our God. So friends, if you would join with me, I'm going to invite you just to stand. And I want to just kind of have a practice time with this together. Just a time where we can live out this teaching. And we're going to sing this song together. And I would invite you to sing along. And after we sing this song, I want to have a a moment of shared silence. A shared stillness before God. And let's invite God to just speak to each one of us. He lives in us, right? John says he's declaring things to us all the time. One of the gifts of walking with God as his sons or daughters is that we can have fresh manna delivered by the Holy Spirit to us every waking moment. If we would just be still and come away, experience that awe together. So let's reflect on his awe. Let's worship him. How great is our God. Then as we're in the presence of God together, we'll wait for him for our next step, okay? Okay.